V1. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Terrain. Terrain. Pull up. Terrain. Welcome to the Flight Safety Detectives. Hosts John Golia and Greg Fife, two of the world's most respected aviation safety experts, talk all things related to aviation and aerospace. This podcast and the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel are brought to you by the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, PAMA, and Avemco Insurance, a world-class provider of aviation insurance and your one-stop for all general aviation insurance needs. Get a customized quote at avemco.com or give them a call at 888-879-0389. Tell them you're a listener of the show and receive a 5% discount. Now it's time to buckle up because it's wheels up for the latest episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Well, hello, gentlemen. It is a special episode of Flight Safety Detectives. We're uh, we're coming a little out of sequence since um, we have an interesting accident that we're going to be discussing briefly today. That is one of these post Turkey Day type accidents. We had a, uh, a, a, a Mooney M20J that was attempting uh, to land at uh, Gaithersburg. The pilot of that particular airplane apparently was uh, was shooting an approach, an RNAV approach into Gaithersburg. Unfortunately, the procedures that uh, require him to uh, to maintain certain altitudes, he failed to do for a variety of different reasons, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But this is uh, an interesting accident because we talk about it basically at the end of every show when it comes to pre-flight planning or pre-planning, really understanding what you're getting yourself into. And then we're going to talk about some of the things that the NTSB and the FAA will be asking of this pilot who survived. And uh, and I know, Todd, that you've done a lot of research. This particular accident happens to be about four miles from where I live in Maryland. And Gaithersburg is one of my home airports. I've flown in and out of there for almost 50 years now. Um, it is uh, one of those airports that is embedded in amongst a uh, not only a light industrial area, but then there are a number of of housing uh, subdivisions that surround the airport. This particular airplane, this M20J, happens to be a based aircraft there. Um, I have not personally seen the airplane. Um, I now know a little bit about the pilot through friends of mine in that pilot community. I was the president of the Montgomery County Air Park Association for 10 years at one point. So it's a very tight knit community. Uh, there are a lot fewer airplanes there now since um, since not only COVID, but since they put the air, uh, airspace restrictions up after 9-11. But it is a very tight knit community. Everybody knows basically everybody else's business. And so when this accident happened last night, my power went out. Um, as did about 100,000 other people in the, in the local area. Um, fortunately, ours came back relatively quickly versus some of those folks. But uh, Todd, you're going to put the pictures up on the internet because they are, um, of course, interesting. Uh, I was asked, I, my phone started blowing up last night um, with friends of mine calling and texting me. And um, they said, man, did these people survive? Did they survive? And I said, well, it all depends on how they hit that 120-foot uh, tower. If they center punched it, maybe not. But apparently the way the airplane is hung up there and the structure that it hit, um, they were very lucky because the front end of the airplane didn't collapse back into their lap where you know we've seen that before when airplanes hit the ground or hit a tree or something like that so they were extremely lucky there were two people on board the pilot and a female passenger and uh, they were coming out of uh, new york and i'll let you talk about that todd because again i want to explore john some of the things that we talk about and of course you close our show with every week about pre-planning and some of the things that should have gone into this pre-planning decision. Uh, last night in the Maryland, D.C. area, um, that weather was lousy all day. It had been raining on and off most of the day. 
with periods of some moderate rain showers, especially towards uh, the latter part of the day. We had low cloud ceilings at that point. Um, we didn't have any of the fog out where I am near the Potomac River at that particular point, but ground fog and fog conditions had started to settle in in the area of Gaithersburg or Montgomery County Air Park. So we'll get into more of that here in a minute. But Todd, why don't you just walk us through what you picked up on flight aware as far as the flight um, altitudes and then what the conditions were that uh, that you were able to pick up? Well, as many of you know, uh, most aircraft out there uh, broadcast an ADSB signal that's picked up by any number of uh, places, including websites like Flight Radar 24 and uh, FlightAware.com. And one of the things they showed us is that, as you can see from the picture, if you're looking at this on uh, the video, this uh, came out of White Plains, uh, went down the East Coast, avoiding most of the uh, major cities, going over places like uh, near uh, um, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Then it turned more or less uh, southeasterly going to Gettysburg, where it hit the tower. And one of the things I looked at is I download the altitude data from it. And a minute or so prior to impact, the aircraft was reporting being at 1,100 feet MSL. And then in the last 48 seconds or so, 46 seconds, it dropped about 500 feet. And the last uh, report was at 600 feet. Now, this tower is about, given the, uh, the uh, elevation of the airport, the tower is, I, I don't know, about 500 feet. So the last reporting point was apparently shortly before impact. And what this shows, uh, in addition to the track, other data showed that at the time, the airport area was in low IFR. And Greg, you just mentioned how bad the weather was. So two or three things about this. One, unlike 10, 15, 20 years in the past, some of the immediate mystery is no longer there because instead of waiting days or weeks for the official pronouncement of what the weather was, what altitude the airplane was, um, the general public, including us, has a general idea of what exactly happened and the time frame in which it happened, which gives us some insights into, I wouldn't say uh, predicting what happened, but at least having a somewhat more informed opinion as to the sequence of events. And, and when we look at those things, um, we got to think about John and what he's always preaching at the end of our shows, and that is, you know, pre-flight planning knowing what you're getting yourself into. It'll be very interesting for investigators to find out since this pilot did survive, um, they reported it as serious injuries. And one of the things um, besides probably impact related injuries is the fact that they were in the power lines. They were stuck at 100 feet above the ground in that aircraft for almost seven hours. It was cold last night. So there is, of course, a concern about hypothermia and things like that because the uh, the uh, first responders really couldn't get up to the aircraft, whether it was with a cherry pick or anything else, until they knew that those lines would be, uh, they, they were de-energized. Um, the power did go out, but you still have to ground those wires to take out any high capacity static and things like that. So there was a process in place. Uh, the first responders here in Montgomery County and, and surrounding counties did an outstanding job. They had to, once they got uh, the word that they uh, they could work in a safe environment, they had to secure that airplane before they tried to evacuate the pilot and the passenger. So, I mean, there was a lot of coordination that had to go on. They had to get uh, a crane involved that could reach that high and stabilize the airplane. And uh, we got to give plaudits to uh, to these first responders uh, just because they're working under, you know, <laughs> very different type circumstances. Uh, but they were able to uh, to get these folks out uh, a little after midnight, close to one o'clock in the morning, and the accident happened at about 5.30 p.m., as I remember the lights going out. So um, one of the things, John, that we talk about is pre-planning. What do you think the board's going to ask or the FAA will ask of this pilot with regard to his pre-flight planning? Well, they're going to be very focused on that, uh, that and decision-making, uh, because both of them play a role here. What did he know about the weather? What did he plan for? Did he plan for an alternative airport if the weather went down on him? You know, or was he planning on getting in here come hell or high water? I'm getting home, you know, get, a, get it in itis, come in, you know, the weather is layered and uh, maybe he tried to tuck under. I mean, if you look at the 
at the uh, what Todd was mentioning, where it was uh, one reading, it was he was at altitude, and the next one he's down right at the at the uh, hundred foot level or so. I mean, that's clearly an indication of somebody that's trying to tuck under. And, uh, you know, so the NTSB investigators are clearly going to look at that. They're going to look at his history, as we did. And he, there was a previous event where his decision making was called into question. And, you know, so between the two, he's going to have some answers uh, to generate other than the altimeter failed at the last minute. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that could definitely. And, and that brings up another point, and that is, did he have everything set up as he should? What kind of uh, in, instrumentation was he using? Was he trying to use all the pretty stuff with uh, all the electronic aids, possible moving map and everything else that would, you know, again, entice him to try and squeak down? This is a based aircraft here. It's obvious that this pilot knew the we think would have known the, the local area. And it may have been that because he knew the local area, he assumed that, you know, well, I'll just keep going down. I'll just keep going down. I'll try and get under the deck and find the lights and, and that kind of thing. So of course, you know, we talk about this all the time. This was a holiday weekend. People are on a short schedule. Um, Sunday night, trying to get home because they know they got to go back to work the following week. Um, like you said, John, it's that get homeitis. It's the self-induced pressure. It's all of those things. It's the justification. Yeah, the weather's bad, but it's not that bad. That's my home airport. I know the area. I can make things happen. I can accomplish the mission. Um, one of the better airports that uh, is an alternate for Gaithersburg is Frederick. Frederick is uh, better equipped with electronic approaches. It's more as far as wide open spaces. It's a large airport, so you're going to see uh, if all the runways are lit up, you're going to be able to see um, a lot more of the runway environment. Going into Gaithersburg, unless you know where those lights are that you're looking for, especially on a dark and stormy night, low vis type night, trying to pick those lights out is damn near impossible because I've flown in and out of that airport for years. And so with all of those things combined, um, like you said, it is the decision making. And now you have a pilot who is flying along. Todd, could you tell from the in route altitude uh, what he was flying at? Was he at a proper uh, typical IFR altitude? Well, that was one of the things that sort of struck me because what little I know about IFR from my IFR training, uh, they tend to be in full thousand foot increments. And there was large parts of the trip where he was, if I can pull it up, going at like 8,300 feet or 40. You know, not at thousand foot increments. So I don't know if that was a measurement error or what was going on there. Yeah. And some of that is GPS altitude versus pressure altitude. So there is a little bit of variation. Uh, but again, um, if the NTSB is going to dissect his profile from takeoff to touchdown, um, that would be something that uh, I as an investigator would be looking at just to make sure that, you know, he was uh, was procedurally correct all the way into the final approach phase was he being vectored did he get the vectors did he follow the vectors and then all of a sudden if he is following the approach because there is a lead-in on that rnav to one four um there are a variety of different waypoints you got to hit at the final approach fix um is a little better than four miles off the end of the runway you're supposed to be at 2200 feet at that point was he at 2200 feet we know a mile off the end of the runway where he struck those power lines he's only 100 feet off the ground and the um, the elevation of the airport the touchdown zone is about 520 feet so um, you start doing some simple math you know how low this guy was and it's obvious that even at a mile and a half out he should have been around 1200 feet or thereabouts and he's half that distance above um above msl not agl but msl and uh that would put him at about 100 feet above the ground and oh by the way that's about where he hit those towers so um those are the kinds of things that the investigators are going to really be ferreting out but it'll be interesting to see what kind of information possibly what kind of excuses <laughs> Uh, this pilot uses as to why he was that low that far away from the airport and what he was trying to accomplish other than landing. Now, this is an interesting point, what you just said about 
what the pilot might say, say to the investigators. In an accident investigation, this is not a legal investigation in that the pilot or anyone who's, in, who's talked to by the NTSB or FAA, they're entitled, not entitled, they're supposed to tell the truth because it's not going to be put into a court of law as is. So even if you're lowering up on yourself, it's like, oh, I should like shade the truth during this investigation. But Some pilots know, may like, do that, but it wouldn't be wise. But again, it's one of those things where, you know, the pilot, it's like getting a speeding ticket. Oh, you know, was I really going that fast? Are you sure? I mean, it is one of those things. And John has seen it as a board member. He had to look at a lot of the FAA actions that were taken against pilots where, you know, somebody else or something else made the pilot do something stupid. Yet the pilot would never confess to that. And you know, um, that what society is today. Nobody has personal responsibility anymore. It's always something else. Somebody else. You know, somebody taking uh, personal accountability for their actions is is uh, pretty rare today. You know, the big thing is, is that we are human. And again, you know, you're always trying to cover your tracks for some of the bad decision making uh, that, you know, one makes. And like John said, you know, it's personal accountability. We talk about it all the time. You got to be accountable and responsible for your actions. And okay, this was probably some very poor uh, aeronautical decision making. The question is what enticed this guy to believe that he could successfully accomplish the mission on that kind of night? Did he actually have correct weather information? Was it current weather information? Was it different when he got it, if he did get it, uh, two hours before he actually made it to the destination? We all know that the weather does change and it, it will change because it's a very dynamic thing. So these are the kinds of things that I would explore as the NTSB, because this is the learning lesson that can go into a report. So again, to cue pilots that, hey, just because you got weather two hours ago and it said you were good to go and you could shoot the approach, doesn't mean that's what it's gonna be when you get there. There are also in route weather service, you can talk to ATC, you can talk to flight service. Uh, they are gonna give you that information um, and so, all of these are tools that pilots should be using to continually update. I can't imagine that the weather just got really foggy in the last two minutes of this flight and this surprised the pilot. I mean, there had to be some forewarning since we knew, at least I knew what the weather was for a good portion of the latter part of the day just by looking out the window. So these are the kinds of things that concern me. And, and of course, for our audience, these are good things to, to be aware of when you do your pre-flight planning, the self-induced pressure. Yes, there is always that, I gotta get home, I gotta go to work, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. But again, we're in general aviation and John, you and I have talked about this on previous shows and that is, you know what? If the weather <laughs> doesn't support you flying general aviation, either park it for another night or find another way home. Yep. And it's, it's uh, interesting that the decision-making, that whole process, you know, did he have an iPad on with the weather service and he was trying to trying to sneak in? Okay, so sometimes what like you said, the automation can let them feel empowered to yes. beat the obstacles, play the odds, right? Yep, exactly. And you know, that's the case here, all right? And, and you have to give the guy the benefit of the doubt. But in this particular case, and what we know so far, it makes it pretty hard to, to uh, not look at the pilot really, really closely. Uh, we're talking about this event and, and really it's because it just happened almost in my backyard and I know the area and know the airport. Um, there's always a backstory. And on this show, we always try to talk about those things the things that don't show up on a report that aren't obvious. We've dissected a number of reports in previous accidents where we've brought things out that you'll never read about or never see or never hear uh, from anyone else. And here's another one of those cases where there is a backstory to this. This pilot happened to own a Piper Lance years ago, and he was involved in a uh, serious accident in Utah, he crashed a Piper Lance with his family on board and uh, consisted of his wife and uh, three kids taking off out of a high altitude airport after refueling the airplane. 
And from what I was able to gather, and I know, Todd, you looked at it too, the guy who serviced the airplane, refueled the airplane, said, yeah, it looks like a pretty good airplane. He didn't think that the airplane was overloaded. Okay, that's great. However, you're operating, this is August of 1992, and in Utah, in the mountains, you got a high density altitude, you got a heavy airplane, and you're going to try and outclimb high terrain. And unfortunately, this pilot got himself into a box canyon, and it's obvious that he tried to remedy the bad situation and uh, ended up having a, uh, a collision into mountainous terrain. Fortunately, himself and, uh, and his family survived. But um, Todd, as you were able to pick up from uh, the NTSB report, what did they say happened in that accident? Probable cause and findings. The National Transportation Safety Board determines the probable cause of this accident to be the pilot's poor in-flight decision. Factors include downdrafts in the Box Canyon. And so, again, when we talk about poor in-flight planning, you know, that is, it started before he actually took off. What was his planning? How did he think he was going to outclimb high mountainous terrain on a hot, high-density altitude day? regard to the investigators, you know, every accident starts really before the aircraft ever leaves the ground. And so that's why it's going to be so important for investigators to really know and understand what the pilot knew with regard to the weather, how much pre-planning he had done to go from point A to point B, and was he properly prepared to go to point C if necessary, which in this case, and again, we're not going to second guess or judge or anything else because we don't have all the real facts yet, but you know, based on the obvious things where the weather was bad, the fog was in, visibility was low, and he's down at 100 feet above the ground heading towards the airport, you can make some obvious conclusions. The question is, were there other external factors that caused him to be that low? So we can never count those things out. Was a problem with the aircraft or anything else? So we have to leave that door open until we can ferret out all the facts, conditions, and circumstances. But like I said, a lot of these accidents start before the airplane has ever left the ground, and this could be another one of those accidents. And as you said, Todd, the board found his decision-making in the 1992 accident questionable. So do we have another type of uh, questionable decision-making in this particular instance? Now, one of the two of the reasons why we're talking about this event so soon after it happened, one, it was in your backyard. Two, it got quite a bit of airplay. This mm -hmm. was wall to wall in the morning news shows and plenty of pictures on the internet and elsewhere. That doesn't necessarily mean we'll have a complete investigation. For example, the 1992 event, as was common back then, this was a general aviation event, non-fatal. There was a very short, basically one page report, no public docket. I would hope, although I'm not putting a lot of faith in that, that there will be substantially more information in the public docket. For example, a detailed statement from the accident pilot more details about uh, planning, weather, et cetera, and something other than a very brief one-page statement. Yeah, well, that's what uh, that's what we're always talking about on this show is the completeness, the thoroughness, and the methodical process that the board and or the FAA, depending on who's in doing the investigation, uh, must go through to get all the facts, conditions, and circumstances because to just have the obvious facts, one, you don't need to leave the office or the house to figure that out. I mean... Just about everybody that saw those pictures, and that's a pilot, we already know what happened. But there is always something to be learned, even from these kinds of accidents, um, that needs to be put into a report and filtered back into the aviation community to enhance aviation safety. That's the purpose of the board. That's the purpose, a purpose of, of the FAA. And that's our purpose um, in talking about these accidents. What can we learn? to enhance aviation safety. Beyond this event, beyond the NTSB or the FAA investigation, there are potentially other impacts. For example, I'm sure that in the immediate vicinity of the airport, there is a large community of people, not all of whom are very friendly to aviation. Anytime there's an event like this, it might be an excuse to raise a question, should this airport be here? Should yep. this be plowed under for another shopping mall? Yeah. I mean, what, do you, no, what have you seen happening with this airport in the years that you've had a very close relationship with? Oh, it's because the, it is surrounded by housing communities. And unfortunately, we had a major accident here several years ago 
where a, um, a an Embraer or Phenom jet, privately owned, flown by a doctor with several associates, crashed in a neighborhood on the approach to runway one for the exact same runway that uh, that the Mooney was trying to get to last night. They crashed in the neighborhood. They burned down a house, and unfortunately, uh, in that accident, it was very tragic because uh, it killed uh, a mother and and children. And so the the cry out there is, why do we have an airport right in the middle of all of these subdivisions and high density, um, you know, light industrial places where, oh my God, if something happens, they're going to hit something. They're going to hit somebody. And so that argument's been going on, but that airport started out as a piece of pavement in the middle of a cornfield back in the 50s because when we moved here when i was very young we went out to that air park and it was like packing a lunch to go out there it was in the middle of a cornfield there was really nothing out there now it's very i mean the commercial um, product and of course some of the uh, the housing developments are parked right up against that airport and so i'm sure there will be a discussion and an outcry about uh, not only this aircraft accident, but the fact that we have a lot of intense uh, student flight training going on right now. And the potential is always there for another type of event. So it's it's going to be interesting. So, and I know that uh, you're working to get yourself back in the air. You're working on your instrument rating and that kind of stuff. So here's uh, here are some things to heed from this. So with the second to the last word, Todd, I will leave it to you before we go to the master. Well, this, ac this accident, combined with my recent training, is really opening up my eyes because I didn't know what I didn't know when it came to large parts of uh, instrument flying. I still don't know as much as I should, but I'm glad I've done the training I have because I'm getting much better insights into this, not just for my own benefit, but just understanding the sequence of events than I would have a year or two ago. And John, with that, this is right up your alley, this particular accident. You know, as I end every show, I talk about pre-planning before you even leave your house or hotel, do it again at the airport. And this is a perfect example of this pilot should have done a more than thorough job because the weather in Westchester uh, County, New York, wasn't much better yesterday. So he should have definitely uh, done a very thorough job of pre-planning. And maybe he did. And maybe we're jumping to conclusions. Uh, we would never do that, John. But maybe even if he did it, you have to listen to your own advice. You have to heed the warnings that you get when you do your pre-planning. You know, it does have it does have the obvious indications of a pilot's decision making was lacking. Uh, and it may be. That's not true, but it does have the obvious indicators that this guy was making very poor decisions about trying to get into this airport. It is his home airport, and that's risky business. Uh, even in the airline business, I've seen airline pilots at their home base taking an awful lot of risky uh, decisions just because that's home and they know, you know, they know what's going on. They know there's no buildings on this approach, so they tend to want to get down a little bit. I mean, we had a, a, a commercial airplane crash at Logan in Boston one time because the pilot was trying to get under the fog. You know, very similar, to get, get that air put in sight. And, and uh, you know, I had worked a couple of accidents in, uh, in New Haven, Connecticut and Bradford, Pennsylvania many years ago, same thing with commercial airplanes, trying to get in under the tuck under and they weren't exactly where they thought they were ran into obstacles yeah so it's yeah. not only just the, the, the pre-planning you do you have to live by what you've planned right and if the plan was that if the weather is bad going into in this case Gaithersburg we then take another one which most likely would have been Frederick right so I mean why take the risk right just because you think you can yeah and anyway, after you do your pre-planning, you have to do a good pre-flight. I've been going through more and more accident reports, and pre-flight issues keep popping up left and right. And I just we're going to do a special uh, show on just pre-flight issues. That's my goal in pulling up all these reports. 
and uh, you know what? If you don't know what you don't, if you don't, are you not comfortable with your pre-flight? Get a mechanic to walk around with you, and remember, touch your airplane, wiggle things, right? make sure the tire pressure is up where it's supposed to be. There's lots of little things that can cause you grief. <laughs> and, Definitely. And bad things happen to pilots that don't look. So, and after you get in the air, put that head on a swivel. I mean, I, I get so frustrated looking at the at the mid-air collisions right around the airports. It's just, it's, it's, it's a tragedy because mm -hmm. they shouldn't happen. And we see, and we just had two big airplane, well, one big airplane, one high performance airplane in Dallas kill five or six people. So, you know what? It's just, these things should not happen with professional pilots. And everybody thinks they're a professional pilot. Well, making poor decisions makes you not a professional pilot. So please, please pay attention from beginning to the end of your flight and fly safely. To listen or watch more episodes of this show, go to FlightSafetyDetectives.com, the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel, or your favorite place to listen to podcasts. To contact John and Greg about the show, send them an email at FlightSafetyDetectives at gmail.com. And remember, for aviation insurance needs, contact Avemco Insurance at avemco.com or give them a call at 888 888- 879-0389. Mention Flight Safety Detectives and receive a 5% discount. Thanks for listening to the Flight Safety Detectives and remember to always fly safe. <laughs>